Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Tom O'Gwen from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Tom. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to say uh, thank you to Yale, thank you to Ravi, thanks to the staff. It's been a wonderful conference. This has become my favorite conference uh, to come to. So um, I want to talk to you about people as space and space, uh, its influence. This was an idea I had um, while walking down the street in Chicago on Michigan Avenue and then Oak Street. Um, so let me tell you about it. The idea, and I come from a, a more sociological background, but this is uh, two psychologists and a sociologist working on something, so it's kind of fun. Uh, that people per, uh, infer the social status by, of others by, among other things, social density. In other words, how many people in a given space at least in American retail settings. Actually, it occurs a lot of places, but we're studying retail. They then extend this inference to the value of something, something being purchased. So, um, why is this? Well, and I apologize for the small type. It looked big on my screen. Anyway, um, first of all, there's, there's three basic explanations for this. One, from sociology, it's social, dummy. Uh, this happens to, uh, due to consumer socialization. Americans, or at least people in consumer cultures, learn that uh, certain social classes are represented in certain ways. They're pictured in certain ways. Actually, one of the people I use is a professor of art here at Yale, uh, uh, Professor Trottenberg, who wrote a very influential book called Reading American Pictures, another book called Picturing Poverty about how the, the wealthy and the poor are, are imagined by Americans very differently because they're pictured differently. Richard Sennett at the London School of Economics, he's a sociologist, um, also talks about the consciousness of the I, about the fact that um, space has an economic value and that we infer value by amount of people in it. Uh, so space is a value relationship that's learned in consumer societies. Psychologists say, well, it's mental, of course. They say it happens due to crowding and how objects and crowds are evaluated. They ultimately come to a, a construal explanation. Or it's that crowding forces people to um, think at a, a very detailed level, whereas when you're not crowded, you tend to think at a very abstract level. And there's a lot of data to support this in crowding. Um, Economists touch on this occasionally, but only occasionally in the burning money literature, and that is that there's an economic value of space. Buying uh, em empty so-called white space in an ad is a signal, an economic signal, et cetera. So several literatures have touched on this, but no one's ever really uh, done this. So we have a long uh, picturing history. Rich people invent picture portraiture. Um, poor people didn't. So if you go to an art museum, you go anywhere, and this is what Professor Trottenberg here at Yale writes about, is that, um, for example, if you, if you think about the Statue of Liberty, give me your huddled masses. If you think about the way we think about the poor, we think of them crowded together. When we think about the wealthy, we think of them more individually or as a family. There's also been, in, in the United States, and I've published work on this too, about in, in modernity, there's been this less is more, the minimalist movement sort of led to this idea of clean, simple, pure. The Rob collection, of course, goes to very wealthy people, and it's about big open space. And who lives in big open space? Well, rich people do. Um, I was talking to, I, presented some of this initial data at a conference, and a friend of mine who's worked at Apple for 25 years, he's a designer, has now moved on to another big company. I was telling this, and he said, this absolutely fits our story. And I said, why? He goes, well, <coughs> we consider that to be our biggest design accomplishment. Because when everybody else was getting out of computer retail, we came in, and we made it work. And we made it work because we spent all this time on design. And what happens is that this was the idea. The reality, unfortunately, has become this. 
and the, the title of my talk uh, is an unattributed quote to someone uh, there who said, yeah, it now looks like a bus station. And people sort of know that, that people have noticed um, that there seems to be some pressure sales when things get crowded. And the kind of questions that are asked are different. And that fits both the construal social psychology question, because when people get crowded and construal becomes very tightly focused, they focus on what? Detail. When the score is uncrowded, they think abstractly. What does Apple want you to think about at the iconic level? They do not want you asking price questions. They do not want you asking <laughs> tech questions. They want you to buy on the iconic value of the brand. So when the store gets crowded, people start asking price questions and tech questions, which is really not Apple's space. So um, our prediction, and what we tell the people there, is that, well, this makes sense to a sociologist and a psychologist, and that our prediction will be that, that when you crowd, all else being equal, when you crowd something, people are less willing to pay for it. And they evaluate the upper shopper, the other shoppers, as of lower social status and income. So I said, you can just do this. You can, and I know search engines are optimized, but just try it yourself. Go to Google Images and type in working class or poor people or rich people. This is just using the phrase working class, upper class. You get five point, almost five and a half people per image when you type in working class, and you get 1.57, which fits what the art historians and everybody says, uh, the sociologists, that <coughs> space is money. Rich people get more space. It's, rich people live in bigger homes. It's rumor in first class, etc. <coughs> Bosses get bigger offices. Deans get bigger offices. <sighs> Deserve it or not. Um, and um, so the question becomes, will people pay more in this somewhat counterintuitive idea, like, so if you have fewer customers, will people pay more for the object? That's what we think will happen, and that's kind of what we heard was happening at some very famous stores. So very quick, very simple, quick first study. We have people look at these images. Now we have to, we use silhouette figures so that we're not giving clues due to clothing or something like that. So we're keeping it very pure at first. So, um, WTP, not being a psychologist, for us, I'm like, what the, and then it's, oh, it's what, what, <laughs> <laughs> willingness to pay, and I was like, oh, okay, I get it. So, um, <laughs> what the, we estimated social class on a one to five scale, estimated annual income, and so we just asked subjects, hey, how much do these stick figures make a year, what's their social class, and uh, then we take these pairs of shoes, which you can see a lot better on a big, monitor and we fuzzy them up so you can't really tell a lot about the shoes. So in the, uh, you'll see this large difference. So just like predicted, when you put a, a small number of people, people estimate a, a big difference in so, socioeconomic status. They think these stick figures are higher social class. They do the same for income. They think, uh, those people over there make $144,000 a year. They think that these people make $93,000 a year. Um, I presented this to the sociology department at, at Wisconsin, <coughs> and uh, they were like, well, of course. I mean, it's total sense. I mean, sure. You, know, um, you guys just figure this out. And uh, then uh, I this is um, a willingness to pay. Look at this price difference, $189 versus $87. Huge, right? Now, you don't have to, these are not, this is not an equation, uh, but this is, this, all you need to know about this is that this is, the effect is, is driven through income. So that subjects are using income to at least partially explain what's happening here. They're making inferences about the other people in the store to judge what the shoes are worth. Study three, we just add a, a middle condition, and to no big surprise you get this, which is almost linear. You get uh, estimated income, 143, 101, 91, estimated social class, it's inversely scale there. So um, as they're getting crowded, they're thinking people are a lower social class. 
Willingness to pay, same thing. Very clean data. And we've now done 15 studies on this using auctions, using uh, all kind of things, thanks to the reviewers at JCR, where we've now done so many studies. That, and um, people like the story so far. And we get the same thing again. We get a nice mediated effect through income. Um, this is one where we did an auction uh, with real, with, um, where we actual people bid real money to buy uh, little stocking caps that the kids in Madison think are really cool and uh, that we could afford to give a bunch away. And we get, to make a long story short, the exact same data. It just replicates, again, with real people using sort of their money. Now I'll tell you what I think all this means and where we go from here. What I think theoretically is going on is very important. Um, in that is you have a convergence of two fields which rarely talk to each other. Actually, sociologists cite economists more than anyone else. In econ and if you look at the citation map, sociologists actually don't talk to psychologists pretty much at all, and vice versa, which is, seems sort of sad since they call it social psychology. But um, <laughs> the, if you look at what, what I term this as a social heuristic, is that people have learned, all else being equal, that a crowd, they don't know anything else, that a crowd means you're less important. You make less money. They then extend that to the object. This extends context effects into humanity. It says humans are part of context. The marketing literature considers context like, you know, pretty dull stuff. Um, so we ex significantly extend context to a social realm. And what's happened in the United States since, you know, income inequality has been growing Social class, which is almost sort of killed off in sociology for a while, is making this huge comeback in sociology. Everybody wants to talk about social class now because we are uh, a nation increasingly become str very stratified. Uh, so we're, we're seeing social status reemerge as something important to talk about in marketing as well. Practically, lower shopper density seems to lead to and I've got a paper where I can send you lots of studies. Higher estimations of other people's uh, social class, a greater willingness to pay, higher prices, a lot higher, and a higher perception of the object's worth. The suggested retail, it also tells you this about how to design retail. Um, if you've been in Microsoft's sort of ripoff of Apple, um, one of the things they learned is make the stores a whole lot bigger. Um, they went to school on that. It, you you want to do anything that yields a perception of spaciousness. Uh, and there are a lot of tricks you can do in retail to do that. Um, I was listening to the Star Starbucks talk yesterday, which I thought was great. And I was thinking, um, well, gee, the Starbucks don't want fewer people in the store. You know. But the, the thing of it is, I would bet, if these data are right, that when a Starbucks gets crowded, and I, too, have spent way too much of my income in there, that when a, when a Starbucks gets crowded, what both the psychologists and sociologists would say is that the number of drink do-overs probably increases. And the reason is, from, from a psychology standpoint, people just become more critical in a crowd. No, that wasn't right. So actually what Starbucks is attributing to barista era may just be crowd error. And um, you, there's just a million implications of this. The ability to keep consumer focused on the brand. My friend at Apple said, you know, <laughs> we just want them to see that big Apple. You know, we just want, I mean, we really don't want them thinking about minutia. And we know that crowds kind of do that to people, and that's not good particularly when you're a premium price. It supports creation and maintenance of iconic brands. If you think about what is a predictor iconicity in a brand, um, it's to do things like this, which sets this brand apart in a, in a space. If you, if you have retail space that, that makes the object special and doesn't give it a discount feeling, um, that tells you some very important things. And it gets consumers thinking about 
what you want to think about and not thinking about what you don't want them to think about. So my work, uh, and there's several papers we're doing on this, is about people, things, and space, which I think is a nice convergence of design. I wish the IDEO people were still here. Um, I, w I think it's a nice convergence of um, psychology and sociology. Um, so what I would recommend to you is to think space and to think sparse. Thank you. I finished early. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, a question. Did you look at um, item assortment? In other words, does the effect, mm -hmm. um, or have you looked at, does this effect apply to limited assortment retail as well? So if you apply, if you project and say big assortment, mm -hmm. perception that I'll get a lower price, less value, versus limited assortment mm -hmm. or controlled assortment means higher price, greater value attributed to the object. Great, great question, and we have done some work that are doing more. We, what we do to get at that is clutter up the environment with design-wise. So we look at the interaction effect of, of crowded human space, crowded design space, and there is a significant interaction, which you would kind of, I, I think your question suggests. We haven't untangled all that yet, and doing this in real space is incredibly complicated. So. We have to get, you know, it's, we do a lot of simula, I mean, computer simulations, then we do auctions. We're negotiating with a firm to do this in real space. Uh, but it gets really tricky because the clothing is such a great social cue. So as scientists, we're trying to kind of say, we're trying to isolate effect and just say it's density. But in, in the real world, people have all kind of cues as to their social class, which Americans are incredibly good at reading. So um, it says all else being equal, right? It's like physicists saying, you know, assume there's no gravity, <laughs> but, but there's, there's that nasty gravity problem. But, um, but I think this still is meaningful. Um, and I think it's um, something that we've had very um, good results at the journals and things. People like this idea, and I, I think, um, we're going to be doing it in a while, and we're going to try to untease all those things. But that's a great question. Yeah. Um, now, uh, crowding could also signal popularity, interest. In yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Could predict the opposite. Do you have, do you have a sense of uh, what moderates when crowding would was, you know, you know, less versus more? Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, humans, I mean, um, so not to be too reductivist about this, uh, and you're right, I mean, humans are very good at nuance and, and context, right? So in certain contexts, you expect, like I just went to, um, I'd been a, I, I'd contributed to a, a, a U.S. Senator's campaign, and, for, and, and to my great surprise, it doesn't take a lot of donation to get invited to a, uh, an inauguration thing. So I went to Tammy Baldwin's inauguration thing, and, and I'm, I'm certainly the poorest person in this room in, in Washington, and, and the only non-lawyer, I think. And um, it, the room was enormously crowded, but I doubt anybody in there has ever met a poor person. I mean, so, so um, people are good at sort of understanding context and say, well, that rule doesn't really apply here. Because I'm sure I didn't evaluate those people as, oh, I think they're street people or something, right? Um, but, yeah, so. Yeah, They, I'm sorry? They produce a line yeah. of people waiting to get in, which is a crowd. Well, and, and now they're, yeah, yeah, that is on the launch, and that is to signal frenzy over a product. But it, you know, within the store, their concern is that when people, some of their very good customers, walk up and see that crowd, that it, it says, eh, not my place. It doesn't, look like a, it doesn't look like a minimalist art museum anymore. It looks like a bus station. Not me. Not Apple. Maybe some, you know, maybe this is some other brand, but not our brand. Or at least that was their impression. Yeah? Did you look at the socioeconomic status of the person doing the validation? Is there a relationship between how they perceive that and their own? Right. And as of now, these have been done both with recruited subjects online and 
with uh, enormously homogenous mid white middle class kids in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and so far there's no difference, but that is a huge issue, right? Because the way someone in one social class reads social class is, is more similar, the data show it to be more similar than you would have thought, but th there are certainly nuance to it. Like people, you know, two thirds of Americans claim to be middle class. Um, <laughs> and um, the people who are really sort of in the upper middle class in the United States tend to be very skilled at reading very small nuance. Uh, firms like um, Design Within Reach or uh, Restoration Hardware or are, are just are great at just capturing that, you know, David Brooks Bobo kind of thing. And, and people make these very fine distinctions about relatively small slices in income. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, if there are two people there, that's the tail of the distribution. That's my key. I'm sorry? If there are only a few people there, I would infer that that's the tail of the distribution they're going to have on average income. So, if you showed a huge yeah. thrift store, would you actually get the we've, we've done that. We've, 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 we've got one study where we're, we basically photoshopped an, a Nordstrom, a, um, a TJ Maxx, and something else. And you get some interactions, but they're not. They don't erase this, but they moderate it, right? So sure. And in a 20-minute talk, I kind of wanted to give you the headline here, but of course, right? Sure. Yeah. This is really interesting. It's, it's not the talk, so it, but, but I, it relates to the earlier comment. If anyone ever goes to Stanford Town Center in Palo, in Palo Alto, there's, a, there's an Apple store that's always packed, and there's a Microsoft concept store a couple doors down that there are always more salespeople in the store than customers. It's empty. Yeah, it's, it's not your talk, but it's a, no, it's a good example. No, but it's it's one. Of it's the thing that they call a paradox. They they just like the, you know we design a space that's that's very popular. The problem is it's become the third place for every teenager in America, and that's not it was intended. Um, but yeah, it's the beginning of a story. But I think the big effects are pretty clear, and they're and they're very consistent with theory. So I think they're real. So. Thank you. Thank you.